Today, we are going to be beating Modern with Upheaval, and the deck is really good. Throughout this video, you will watch me play against meta modern decks with this list. The two main ways we will make a lot of mana is with Astral Cornucopia and Everflowing Chalice, but with a unique twist. We will be paying zero mana for both of these spells. Both Surge Node and Core Tapper will be used to put charge counters onto these artifacts, so quickly on early turns we can start tapping them for more than two mana. To surround this strategy, we have Emery, Urza, and Karn to support our game plan and help work towards an upheaval. We also have Chalice of the Void, which I should know also uses charge counters, and Urza Saga to help steal wins. If you enjoy me playing decks like this, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button to show me that you want more videos like this. Start off the first round, we were on the play and I decided to keep a really risky hand just for the memes that we had upheaval in it. Now, it wouldn't be a normal video if I didn't lose to a turn one Ragaban from the opponent so that people could rush to the comments to complain about Modern Horizons 2. We ended up losing game one just because of a scammed fury. Because this game wasn't very entertaining, I'm just gonna skip through it. As this video is here to showcase the power of this deck and upheaval, the reasons why I won both games two and games three is because of Urza Saga. The opponent was playing a discard deck, and would you know that the Urza Saga is good against discard and we just attacked them with constructs. So let's move on to the next round where we actually cast upheaval. Starting the next round, we're on the play, and while this looks like a mulligan, it's actually a keep. Not only do we have Surge Node, but we have Astral Cornucopia, which we can use the Surge Node to pump, which is technically a land. We also have Emery, which will be insanely cheap because we're going to be putting artifacts onto the table quickly. We start the game by putting our combo on the table and ship it back to the opponent. They start off with an untapped breeding pool and cycle a striped Riverwinder, showing that they're on living end and clearly digging for either a black card for grief or a grief for their black card. Top decking a Saga was great, we can play that, use Surge Node to put a counter on our Cornucopia, and then play our Core Tapper, setting up for a lot of mana next turn. What's perfect about Core Tapper is that you can sacrifice it to put two charge counters on any artifact without any additional cost, meaning that you can sacrifice it in response to Living End and get them back straight away. With the opponent just cantripping and passing back, we uptick our Urza Saga, find a Surge Node, and now we can dump our whole hand. We start the turn by using our Core Tapper to put a counter on our Cornucopia, and then use the Urza Saga and the Surge Node to do the exact same thing. And now our Cornucopia taps for three blue mana so we can cast the Urza from our hand. As Urza lets us tap artifacts for one blue mana, we can use the Construct to cast the Surge Node and then tap the Surge Node to cast the Emery. And like a beast, if you did not notice, Emery milled two creatures into the graveyard. We now have a Core Tapper and a Thought Monitor. So if my opponent fires off a Living End here, we can sack our Core Tapper in response and get three creatures back on the table. I don't think my opponent knows what's about to happen to them. We sack the core tapper, take up our Cornucopia to five counters, and then get back our creatures. What's even more insane is that Thought Monitor found Chalice of the Void. Now, Living End does play Force of Negation, so I'm about to show you a very cool play to help us play around Force of Negation, guaranteed. We found an Everflowing Chalice off the top, we don't care about an Urza Construct, so let's float a mana with Urza Saga and get a Tormod Script in case the opponent does Living End again. Now, Force of Negation is 3 CMC, but what I'm going to do is play Chalice of the Void on 0, and as you know, Chalice of the Void cares about charge counters, so now we're going to tick Chalice of the Void up to 3 charge counters. Core Tapper is really strong. And now, with a Chalice of the Void on 3, all we got to do is pump up that mana and cast Upheaval. It goes onto the stack, and it resolves. With 4 mana floating and loads of artifacts in hand, we can actually get this Thought Monitor down into play and leave the opponent with no lands. The opponent concedes, and we move on to sideboarding. To go into boarding, I just take out two Mishra's Baubles for two Metallic Rebukes. There is a good argument to bring in the fourth Chalice of the Void, but I was just thinking about Karn. Maybe it's loose. For game two, we are going to be on the draw, and we have a really good opening hand. Any hand with a zero drop ever flowing Chalice and a Core Tapper, you almost have to keep because it generates so much mana, and to be even more of a plus, we have castable creatures alongside them. The game starts off really slow because it's living end, but something interesting is that they weren't cycling cards on my end step. Anyways, we get a turn 2 Emery down and we pass back the turn. Now to my surprise again, the living end player doesn't cycle a creature again, so we have to assume that they have counters and interaction up because they would not keep a hand with no cyclable creatures for no reason. Anyways, the opponent passes back again, we find an Emery and we don't have a second blue source. 
Here I decide to develop my mana, so I cast a core tapper, use it to sacrifice onto the Everflowing Chalice, and now my Everflowing Chalice taps for two mana, we can recast the core tapper. Then I pass back the turn and yet again my opponent does not cycle a creature, so almost certainly they have Force of Negation, right? Because I've only cast creatures when they've had the mana up for Force of Negation? I'm not too sure though. On their turn they just shock an esteemment and pass back and we don't draw another blue source. So what I'm going to do here is start with Core Tapper onto the Everflowing Chalice and the opponent cycles a creature in response and then lets the trigger resolve. Then we can do something really cool here, we can multi-kick the Everflowing Chalice in the graveyard and then cast the Thought Monitor from our hand. It resolves so we gotta pass the turn back. Yet again my opponent plays a tap land <laughs> and passes back the turn. But this time, on my upkeep, they actually have a spell to cast. They cycle Stripe Riverwinder and then use Living End on my upkeep, so in response I have to use Core Tapper on the Everflowing Chalice, and I'll be getting that back from the graveyard. Now there's a slight problem after this Living End resolves, is that they have a Force of Vigor to destroy both of my Everflowing Chalice. So here we've got to let it resolve and try and rebuild because we didn't find a land off the top of the deck. The opponent just attacks and passes back the turn. While we don't draw a land, we draw a Conucopia, which means we can finally use Core Tapper to generate colored mana. And somehow the opponent still doesn't have any interaction to what I play, so I dump to the board. I pass back the turn, the opponent doesn't really do anything but attack, which I'll take the trade with the Stripe Riverwinder. And now that we can untap with this amount of mana, we can wreak some havoc. I ended up deciding not to go for the upheaval plan, I just wanted to set up a way to block this Curator of Mysteries and then go for it next turn with a Chalice the Void. On their turn, all they do is play another Curator of Mysteries and say go. And now we can use the same Chalice of the Void trick from game 1 to stop them from casting Force of Negation and use Upheaval to win the game again. Going into the next round, we're on the play but have to mulligan a clunky 7 and keep a very nice 6. Like I said, any hand that generates mana with a core tapper and an Everflowing Chalice is an instant keep. We bought on the Chalice because it's strictly worse than Conucopia and we start off with the Node and the Conucopia. The opponent then just plays a Spire Bluff Canal on their turn, showing that they're either Murktide or Living End. As we found a Conucopia off the top, what we can do is use our node to pump the first Conucopia, then use that 2 mana to play the Core Tapper, and then play the other Conucopia to put that on the table. Now the opponent does have an Unholy Heat on the end step to try and kill the Core Tapper, but we can just sacrifice it in response. Now I put the two charge counters on the naked Conucopia, and that's because I'm afraid of Archmage's Charm. Don't forget, that can steal our zero drop artifacts. Now the opponent just played a canal and passed back, so we have to be wary of a card like Counterspell, so all I'm going to do is pump one of my Conucopias and ship the turn back. They do cantrip on our end step, but the thing that I'm focusing on is making constructs that can bash in for a lot of damage, because the opponent isn't pressuring me, so I'm meant to pressure them. They do nothing on their turn, so we make a construct on their end step, they fetch on our upkeep and we make a construct in our main phase, and get a Tormod script to play around a Murktide. We then cast another node. Then I go to combat, bash in, and the opponent Archmage's Charms in combat. As I'm going to be starting to slam bombs, I need to be scared of things like Murktide Region as well as Unholy Heat, so I'm just going to use the Tormod script and pass back and pray that these spells resolve. Now, the opponent just completely puts their hand face up when they Lightning Bolt and Unholy Heat the Construct, attack in and play a tap land, so that means that they must have something like Spell Pierce, which makes their hand really face up and makes it really easy to play around, especially when we have a creature to cast. So I start off the turn with an Urza, and it resolves. Now we can use some mana shenanigans to play the Thought Monitor, draw cards, play more artifacts, eventually cast the Karn playing around Spell Pierce, and I decide to get the Chalice of Void just to eat the Spell Pierce out of their hand, but they don't end up having it, meaning we get a Chalice of One on the table. And from this spot, the opponent just concedes. Going into boarding, I bring in two Metallic Rebuke and two Dismember for four Emery, as Emery is weak to things like Mystical Dispute, Lightning Bolt, and Unholy Heat, all cards we're expecting them to have in games too. Going into the next game, on the draw, this hand is amazing. Two cyborg cards, a Chalice of the Void, a Core Tapper, and an Urza. I don't think I could really ask for much more. The opponent starts off with a Ragavan. We rip Conucopia like a beast off the top and dismember that Ragavan to the graveyard where Modern Horizons 2 belongs. Now the opponent just plays a land and passes back, putting it so face up that they have a counterspell, but because like a beast again we ripped Urza's Saga, let's just play that, hold up Metallic Rebuke, and start making constructs. They don't do anything on their turn, so we don't do anything on our turn. They're going to have to act on these constructs. The opponent eventually casts a Ragavan and passes back the turn. On their end step we make a construct, in our main phase we make a construct, but in response to the Urza Saga trigger, the opponent has a dress down. Now what is fortunate enough is that we can get a Surge Node and hold a Metallic Rebuke on their turn so the shields aren't down. The opponent attacks him with Ragavan and hits a Conucopia off the top of the deck. They then follow up with an expressive iteration. 
that iteration finds a Brotherhood's End, and what's really good is they tap out to cast the Brotherhood's End, and we have the Metallic Rebuke. Now we just have to pray we find an untapped land to slam this Urza as they're tapped out. Come on, you know I'm a beast, Flooded Strand off the top, and an upheaval, let's turn around this game and start slamming. Nothing hypes up the boys more than the fact that you can have a Murktide opponent tapped out, crying in their seat watching you dump to the board. We get everything down and pass back the turn. On the opponent's turn, all they do is cast a Murktide Regent and have to say go with two mana up, representing Counterspell. But remember what we did against Living End when we thought the opponent had a Counterspell and we had a Chalice of the Void in play? I think you can see where this is going. To start off the turn, we cast our first Core Tapper, and then we use the other Core Tapper to put a Charge Counter on the Chalice of the Void. In response, they have to play Dress Down, and now we can make mana with our whole board and get a lot of mana to cast this Upheaval. What's even better is that the Upheaval will actually bounce the Dress Down, which means we can replay the Urza and start tapping that for mana too and put another Chalice on 1 on the board. This opponent is so dead, it's so amazing that we managed to beat Murktide with this list. In round 4, we sadly had two non-games against Indomitable Creativity. In the first game, they just had Thoughtseize plus Interaction to instantly kill me, and in the second game, they had turn 1 Thoughtseize, turn 2 Nature's Claim, when I mulliganed. However, round 5, we managed to crush Grixis Death Shadow that was playing the new Underworld Breach technology. Overall, I really like this deck, and I actually think it's a viable decision to play in modern right now. The fact that you can make massive constructs, generate a ton of mana, use upheaval to win, use Urza to win, use Emery to win, I think it's pretty good. So for you gambling degenerates, I'll make sure to open the chest at the end of this video. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed this, and check out this video because YouTube thinks you'll like it.